everybody. Can you hear me okay? Great. Okay, well, thanks so much for having me uh, speak here. It's a real pleasure to be at Fashion Forward Dubai. Um, my name's Amber Butchart. I'm an associate lecturer at London College of Fashion. London College of Fashion actually run a series of short courses here in Dubai as well. Um, I think there's some information on your chairs and you can also speak to Natasha who's over here in green if you want any more information. Um, okay, so welcome to 10 outfits that changed the world. Uh, now choosing 10 items alone can be very difficult. So I've tried to choose items uh, that each illustrate something either about the place of fashion today um, or about the history of dress itself. So really each item here that I've chosen tells a story. Uh, and what I really wanted to do was demonstrate the historical importance of dress because clothes can tell us a great deal about the wearer um, and they can also tell us a lot about the society that they were formed in as well. Uh, now, I want you to bear in mind that I am uh, coming from a Western fashion perspective here as well. So I'm very, very keen to hear examples from other places in the world. You can come and find me afterwards uh, and give me some suggestions if you have any. Um, so the history of dress, I'm a fashion historian as well as an associate lecturer at London College of Fashion. So my real interest is in the history of dress, the history of fashion and the wider stories that these can tell us, these things can tell us. So the history of dress really makes up the fabric of society. It fulfills roles from court pageantry through to tribal rituals, and it's indelibly bound to the spectacle and display that surrounds human ceremonies from the cradle to the grave. Fashion has also been instrumental in driving industry, innovation, and economic growth. Uh, right through from sumptuary laws that sort of fostered protectionism, uh, to medieval London's great 12 livery companies. Now, these 12 livery companies actually formed the basis of the City of London Corporation that's still running today. And when they were set up uh, in sort of the 11th, 12th century, uh, five of them, five of the 12, were directly concerned with the production and distribution of clothing. So clothing really speaks volumes about the culture in which it was produced, from the political arena to the social. Uh, and studying these objects can really illuminate history. So here are my 10 outfits that changed the world. I'd like to begin here with King Louis XIV of France, and specifically with his shoes. Now, throughout, dress, uh, throughout history, dress has symbolized wealth and status, and it's been used to uphold systems of power. And that's where I want to start with this first uh, item. This is King Louis XIV of France in a painting that he commissioned in 1701. Now, Louis was hugely influential in a number of ways um, because his reign saw the birth of the couture industry, and his patronage also saw the establishment of the French ballet. He actually set up some of the first dance schools uh, in France, which went on to create some of the first professional ballerinas. And he was also obsessed with shoes, especially shoes with red heels, as you can see demonstrated here. Now, during his reign, only aristocratic men could wear shoes with red heels. They were strictly reserved for the court, um, the red dye that made uh, this colour was created with crushed beetles and it was very, very expensive at the time to produce. So during this time, both men and women wore high-heeled shoes. That's really sort of the key to this item. Uh, Louis' heels sometimes reached as high as five inches um, because high heels, of course, were originally worn by men. They were worn by men um, for horse riding in Persia. And Louis XIV became so associated with his high-heeled shoes um, that after the revolution, um, towards the end of the 18th century in France, there was actually a fashion for flat shoes, which was very symbolic. It really symboled out the apparent sort of leveling of society that happened after the revolution. Now today, of course, we associate red soles uh, with possibly the most desirable shoe designer working at the moment, Christian Louboutin. 
And he actually learned his craft by watching showgirls dance and wanting to make shoes for showgirls. So there's that kind of dance history link there as well. And the red sole is a trademark uh, of Christian Louboutin, which really is a branding dream because you can tell his shoes from a long way away. You can tell a pair of uh, Louboutin shoes without having to understand anything else about his design signature. It really is a sort of universal uh, design aspect that anyone can understand and anyone can see. It was actually recently the subject of a lawsuit with another very high-end brand, Yves Saint Laurent, who had created a red shoe. Uh, now, believe it or not, Le Boutin actually has trademark protection over the red uh, shoe sole. So other companies have to make an entirely red shoe um, if they want the sole to be red as well. That's the only way that Yves Saint Laurent were able to produce a red shoe. A red sole was by having the entire shoe in red. Yves Saint Laurent's lawyers actually referenced Louis XIV during the court case. They also referenced the other famous red shoes from history, the ruby slippers from the Wizard of Oz. Now this really shows the importance of the Sun King, of Louis XIV, uh, in the history of red shoes. But it also highlights the cultural history of the high heel as well, because historically it was related to status and power. However, as we know, Heels have a powerful association with femininity today. We don't tend to see many men rocking five-inch heels. Now, debates kind of rage around this as to whether it's an empowering or a debilitating item for women to wear. But the Sun King, Louis XIV, really shows us that our gendering of clothing um, hasn't always been the same. It has definitely changed throughout history. Okay, so item number two. This is a Spitalfield silk mantua. Now, before the end of the 17th century, the majority of the population in the UK wore clothing made from either wool or linen. When the aristocracy wanted to wear silk, it had to be imported from France or Italy or from further east as well, from the Far East. Uh, and it was incredibly, incredibly expensive. The small silk trade in Britain consisted mainly of trimmings, things like ribbons, not so much full items or sort of full uh, bolts of silk. But in 1685, a political decision was made in France that would alter the history or the fashion history of Britain forever. In that year, Louis XIV, again, quite a famous figure in the history of fashion, he repealed the Edict of Nantes, which had allowed Protestant Christians to practice their religion in Catholic France. With this repealed, Protestants, uh, and especially a group known as the Huguenots, found themselves under persecution, and many of them fled to Protestant Britain. They settled around the Spitalfields area, which is in East London, is now a very, very fashionable area in London. Uh, and you can still see the evidence of the Huguenots that lived in this area in the architecture, in the buildings um, around Spitalfields. And they brought with them their secrets of the silk trade. Now, many silk weavers from Lyon settled in this area in London, and the British industry blossomed as a result of this. France at the time was a commercial and a political rival of Britain. Uh, so these trade secrets were very important for the domestic industry to be able to flourish in the face of competition from across the channel. So it really shifted the balance of English-French trade because England no longer had to rely on imported luxury goods from France. Uh, now these were closely guarded trade secrets that the Huguenots brought with them. It would have been much harder for the industry in England to flourish without that immigration, that mass immigration of the Huguenots from France, who were incredibly skilled artisans. Now, not only did this shift the balance between France and England, but it was also key to industrialization. It was hi the highly decorative, incredibly expensive dresses such as these, uh, made from silk that was woven by Huguenot embroiderers, that really helped to drive the Industrial Revolution. 
the quest to reproduce this effect in a more affordable way, uh, along with other reproductions, like trying to recreate chintzes from India um, as well, all of these uh, desires and drives really led to the technological advances uh, in printing and in weaving that then hastened the Industrial Revolution. It was really the desire to mechanically replicate um, these luxury handcrafts for a mass market that led to the Industrial Revolution, the industrial boom of the 19th century. Now this dress here would have been worn at court um, and you can see it would have been um, fairly difficult to move around easily in it. You would have had to turn sideways to walk through doors. Uh, it's from 1752 and it's actually in the collection of the Museum of London. If you are in London, you can go and see this dress on display. Okay, next, this is Marie Antoinette, uh, who was the Queen of France um, at the time of the French Revolution. Now, a woman called Rose Bertin was the milliner and the dressmaker to Queen Marie Antoinette, and she was even called her Minister of Fashion. Despite being a so-called commoner, um, she was often received at court by the Queen, which was actually in breach of etiquette. She didn't hold the kind of um, birth position that was supposed to allow her into these kind of closed court circles. Uh, but Marie Antoinette had such a passion for dress, for fashion, uh, and expressing herself in this way that she allowed Rose Bertin, her dressmaker, into the court circle. As a result of this, Bertin was hugely influential over the trends of the French court. Now, this was partly due to her proximity uh, and influence over the Queen. Now, Marie Antoinette was a very problematic figure during the period of the French Revolution. She was criticised, hugely criticised, for the flamboyance of her dress. She was never really able to strike the right balance between clothing that was seen as appropriate for monarchy, um, while not demonstrating sort of excessive opulence in a land that was increasingly economically divided. In the early 1780s, encouraged by Rose Bertin, her dressmaker, uh, Marie Antoinette took up a simpler sort of faux rural mode of dress when she was at um, the Palace of Versailles. You can see it here. This look consisted of loose muslin dresses, uh, crucially worn without panniers, without, so it didn't have the huge uh, sort of court-shaped styles that we saw in the earlier picture. Um, and also largely worn without a corset, which is another really key point to this style. Um, and it meant that the soft fabric, this incredibly soft muslin here, could rather shockingly mould to the shape of her legs as she was walking around. Now this portrait of Marie Antoinette wearing this style caused moral outrage in France when it was put on display. The dress was so light and so flimsy that it was believed that the queen had been painted in her underwear and it quickly garnered the moniker chemise à la reine, which basically translates as underwear of the queen. The style became known as a chemise dress. Uh, the chemise was the item that women would wear underneath the corset, so it really was underwear, like the, the layer that you would wear closest to your skin. Um, so people essentially thought she was posing in her underwear. I mean, you can imagine um, the kind of shock that would happen even today if um, you know, a member of royalty was seen, was painted basically in their underwear. So you can imagine the kind of shock that this caused at the end of the 18th century. Now, not only was this scandalous in itself, but she was also accused of lacking patriotism. The swathes of muslin that this dress is created from were imported from India. And so this led to um, accusations that she was putting French silk merchants out of business. She really couldn't win, Marie Antoinette, whatever she did, she just couldn't win. Um, so Marie Antoinette eventually reverted to the much more elaborate court styles that we saw earlier. Um, and when she reverted to those, Bertin's opulent creations really became symbolic of the imbalance of wealth of the regime in France at the time. People were starving in France, 
uh, revolution drew closer, and pamphleteers really denounced Rose Bertin, the queen's dressmaker, as a corrupt and corrupting maker of luxury goods. That's what they wrote about her. Marie Antoinette herself became a real symbol of the excesses of the aristocracy, and she was guillotined in 1793. Rose Bertin, her dressmaker, fled to London to avoid the terror that happened after the revolution. She only returned to France in 1795, by which time the huge political upheaval had irrevocably changed fashion and had paved the way for more egalitarian, more democratic styles to, take, uh, to gain favour. However, this style of dress became hugely, hugely popular. And that's one of the main reasons that the very early 19th century, the Regency era, really stands out so much in terms of fashion. Because it's very different to what came immediately before, and it's also very different to what came immediately after as well, which was the very corseted hourglass shapes uh, of the 19th century. If you've seen any Jane Austen period dramas, then you'll know that uh, empire line muslin dresses were all the rage in the 19th century, the very early 19th century, uh, with no undergarments, no sort of structured undergarments, and very, very little corsetry. So this style, even though it caused such a shock in the 1780s, was actually hugely influential. And ironically, it was also taken up by Empress Josephine, the first wife of Napoleon after the revolution. Item number four is trousers. Now, in the early years of the 19th century, so around the same time that women were wearing the sort of Regency era, Jane Austen, Empire Line muslin dresses, a new group of stylish young men emerged in Britain led by one man in particular called Beau Brummel. Brummel became close friends with the Prince Regent, who at the time was the most important man in the country. The Prince relied really heavily on Brummel's style advice, and so Beau Brummel's style of dressing caught on. The young men who followed Brummel's lead were known as the dandies. Now, dandy didn't mean quite the same thing back in the early 19th century as it does now. Today, when we hear the word dandy, we think of a man who's incredibly flamboyantly dressed, who's very, very flashy, but initially it actually meant the exact opposite. Beau Brummel believed in a very sober style of dress with muted colours, um, very far away from um, the sort of elaborate court dress that men would wear in pre-revolutionary France. For Beau Brummel, style was all in the details. It was all about the minutiae of tailoring um, and having everything just right. He was hugely influenced by military clothes, by uniform, um, and by very strict tailoring as well, as opposed to the flashy embroidery and loose jacket styles that men had been wearing a century before. So throughout the uh, 18th century, men in the aristocracy were dressed as gaudily as women covered in silks, patterns, embroidery, um, gold and silver lacing, very, very elaborate. Beau Brummel stripped all of that back completely. Brummel began to be regarded in the circles around the Prince Regent of Great Britain as an oracle on all matters of style. He played a huge role in popularizing trousers, as you can see here, as opposed to knee breeches, now, before this, men had, for centuries of the aristocracy, had worn knee breeches um, with silk stockings, not trousers that we kind of uh, think of a sort of classic item of menswear today. His, another one of his major contributions as well was popularizing the neck cravat that you can see in this uh, picture here. He would tie it very, very elaborately and very, very high as well. And it's been said that people would even go to his house and watch him dress in the mornings, something, and a sort of ritualistic uh, sort of, um, occasion that could sometimes take hours. And he could go through sort of three or four cravats at a time before he got it just right. Now, this is something, of course, that you could only do if you were very, very wealthy. His mantra was no perfumes, but fine linen, plenty of it, and country washing. Now, this is at a time when people uh, in England weren't known for bathing regularly. 
Uh, so they would use perfume to disguise the smell. Brummel, however, washed every day, which was quite an anomaly at the time. He didn't believe in perfume to disguise the smell. He just believed in there being no smell at all. And the country washing from his mantra also refers to the smoke and the smog in London at the time. London was just sort of in the, um, starting to really gear up the Industrial Revolution. And it was an incredibly filthy place to be living. In order to get your cotton absolutely whiter than white, you'd have to send it outside of London to be laundered. It's quite laborious and, again, something you could only do if you had a lot of money. Now, dandies, Beau Brummel and his sort of uh, set of very stylish friends were, were satirised in the press quite heavily. It was seen as quite effeminate to be that interested in your appearance. And the cravat was especially ridiculed for coming up so high. Beau Brummel's notoriety actually ended when he had a very famous falling out with the Prince Regent as well. The story goes that he apparently turned round to someone at a party who had arrived with the prince, and he uttered the immortal line, who's your fat friend? Uh, as you can imagine, it didn't go down too well with the prince, and the prince never spoke to him again. However, Beau Brummel's had a long-standing influence on the way that men dress, mainly because he popularised the use of trousers instead of breeches. Now, trousers may not sound revolutionary to us today, but as I said before this, men of fashion only wore breeches. It's also the tightness of them that was apparent as well. There's the combination of the coat being cut away at the front, you can see this style of coat here, and then incredibly tight trousers that he would wear, which sort of essentially frames the crotch. It's quite a sort of sexualized way of dressing for men at this time. The men's fashion, as well as women's fashion, was actually pretty racy uh, at this period in the early 19th century. Uh, and it was also mimicking the classical marble statues that were being rediscovered all over Europe during this period in history. It was also this particular colour scheme that he popularised of black, cream and buff, very sort of pared down colourway, um, that also caught on for menswear. And some people think that we can essentially credit Beau Brummel with, the, with having invented the suit. Okay, moving on to a designer called Charles Worth. Now, Charles Worth is a very, very important name uh, in fashion history. And he's associated with two big innovations of the Victorian era of the 19th century. That's the crinoline and also couture. The cage crinoline was developed in the 1850s, and it consisted of a huge frame. It could be up to six feet wide, um, and it regularly changed shape. It could be either bell shape um, or flat at the front and protrude at the side and back. You can see some examples of crinoline styles here. It's very classic sort of high Victorian styles, what we think of when we think of, say, um, uh, the styles that were being worn in films like Gone with the Wind, um, that very mid-19th um, century bell-shaped skirt. So the classic mid-Victorian silhouette of a tiny waist, which would have been helped by corsetry, and this huge skirt below it. Now, funnily enough, the cage crinoline itself, which was this huge structure, as I said, that was worn under the skirt to give this um, shape, when it was first developed in the 1850s, it was actually seen as a very liberating item for women. Now, that might seem very strange to us today, but they were actually much, much lighter than the layers and layers of petticoats that had been worn previously to achieve this shape. Um, you know, women would be wearing sort of seven, eight layers of clothing under their skirts, and it could be very, very heavy. So the crinoline was actually a much more practical item uh, in a weird way. However, it obviously wasn't that practical still. Um, it had to be taken off uh, if you wanted to travel on public transport. There are some fantastic early photographs of um, horse-drawn sort of stagecoaches with all of these sort of caged crinolines hung up on the back because women would have to take them off before they could get into the coach. It was also a disaster if a woman fell over because it was so light um, that the cage would ride up. So it could very easily also be caught in a gust of wind. 
Um, and at this period, women weren't wearing that much um, underwear. Knickers were a very, very new invention at this time. So if your skirt rode up, you really, really were in a lot of trouble. Um, they were also very hazardous because they could very easily catch on fire as well. They were so huge that if you kind of wandered backwards towards the open fire, you've got no real sort of concept of where your dress ends. So you could you read about a few tragedies that happened throughout this middle period of the 19th century where women would kind of go up in flames, um, sort of fashion to die for um, in a very true sense of the word. Eventually, the caged crinoline was mass-produced. Um, and at this time, middle-class and upper-class trendsetters lost interest in the crinoline because it became available to working-class women as well. Now, this is a very common feature of Victorian fashions. As soon as styles are taken up by the lower classes, the middle and the upper classes move on to something new. You get the same trend cycles to a degree now as well. Like this is kind of how fashion trends are born um, and reach a peak point and then they die. However, now it's kind of less class-based, but you do still get that um, cycle. You know, as soon as a trend reaches saturation point, it dies and kind of moves on. So back to Charles Worth. Charles Worth designed many crinoline styles in the 1850s and 1860s. These are some of his designs here. Uh, now, to take a little step further back, Charles Frederick Worth was actually born in Lincolnshire um, in England in 1825. And in his youth, he worked for various London textile mills. In 1845, he moved to Paris and he became a salesman for a textile company. He had a lot of success and he eventually opened a dressmaking uh, department for the company and then branched out into his own business as well in the 1850s. Now, luckily for him, his foray into fashion uh, and his, the development of his own business coincided, at the same, uh, coincided with the reinstatement of the Second Empire in France. So Napoleon III was the new emperor uh, of France, and Paris was once again an imperial capital. And this is very important because it meant there was a huge flurry of state events that people needed to be dressed for. There were a lot of women, a lot of balls, a lot of women that were in need of fine dressing, of luxury clothing. So the demand for these luxury goods and textiles grew, and Emperor Napoleon's wife, who was called the Empress Eugenie, set the styles at court. She was a huge fashion icon at this time. You can see her here in yellow. Now, Eugenie favoured Charles Worth's designs, and her patronage was really instrumental for his success. Now, what was revolutionary about Charles Worth was that he designed pieces seasonally. He showed four um, seasonal collections per year, and he also showed them in advance of the coming season, as we still do today. Now, before Charles Worth, women of means would employ a dressmaker to create items to their own taste. You'd have circulating fashion plates, um, you know, there would be um, trends and fashions that people would follow, but essentially the details of the design would be up to you and you would instruct your dressmaker as to how to create these. So dressmakers were very much subservient to the taste of their employers. However, in designing the garments himself, Charles Worth dictated what was good taste. He dictated what was in fashion. Um, and so he essentially decided what was fashionable. He was also the first person to put his name on a label in clothing as well. So the importance of the designer name, the label of branded goods, really starts here with Charles Worth. He also used live models as well to showcase his designs, including his own wife, who was a great um, model of his dresses. So with all of these um, innovations put together, Charles Worth essentially put the wheels in motion for the couture fashion system that remains with us today. And so that really is the story of how it was an Englishman that actually invented haute couture. next item is the bowler hat. And the bowler hat is really an icon 
of the Edwardian British businessman. It's kind of what a lot of people, I think, a sort of bowler hat and an umbrella is what a lot of people think of when they think of England, English men. Uh, the, the bowler hat itself was developed in 1849, and it was the brainchild of Locke & Co, who are a hat company who have been fitting hats on royal heads since 1676. They're still in business now in St. James in London. You can go in and see their, uh, their shop, their showroom. I would definitely recommend it if you're in London. Um, their store is a real cornucopia of millinery apparatus and artifacts. Um, they've got some famous hats there, including a hat that was owned by Wellington. They've also got Victorian instruments uh, for measuring and drawing the shape of your head that are still in working order. So do, I would put this on your list of things to do next time you're in London. Go and see it. Now in 1849, Lock & Co commissioned Thomas and William Bowler to create a hard-wearing hat for a Norfolk farmer. Um, who was called Edward Coke. Now, the, the purpose of this was to create, uh, was to um, protect gamekeepers' heads as they were riding around country estates. Uh, so if you think about it, you'd be on your horse riding around the country estate, you're a gamekeeper, you want to keep your head protected from the tree branches that you might be going through. And what you essentially need is a kind of hard hat, the kind of thing that we would often see today on building sites. And that's really what the bowler hat initially was. The practicality and the strength of the hat caught on. And before long, no businessman in London was fully dressed without one. And the story goes that when Coke arrived to collect the hat, he actually stamped on it twice to test its strength before he handed over his payment of 12 shillings and leaving satisfied. It was taken up by businessmen at the turn of the 20th century, and it's pretty much been our national symbol ever since, even though it originated as an early version of a labourer's hard hat. But item number seven is the trench coat. Now, the First World War, uh, also known as the, the Great War, really changed a lot about the way that people dressed. Um, it changed uniform design heavily. Uniforms had to adapt to meet with the new sort of demands of industrialized warfare. Um, but it also introduced new items in the wardrobe, into the wardrobe that soon passed over into civilian life as well. Um, one sort of side story of this uh, that not many people know about is actually the wristwatch. Uh, before the First World War, the wristwatch was something only worn by women. It was seen as a very sort of feminine, effeminate item. Um, but as soldiers in the trenches, you know, a pocket watch wasn't really practical if you're fighting a war in the trenches. So officers began wearing watches on their wrists. These kind of associations with heroism when soldiers stuck and the wristwatch became a very uh, fashionable item for men after the war as well and has remained so ever since. However, it's not the wristwatch that I'm uh, here to talk to you about today. Um, the most enduring symbol of the First World War is really the trench coat. Now, World War I saw the trench coat become a unisex style staple. Uh, though most people associate it with the First World War, hence the name of the trench coat for fighting in the trenches, it was actually the Boer War in the late 19th century that introduced officers to what would later become the fully-fledged trench. It was developed by Thomas Burberry. Burberry is a name I'm sure we're all still familiar with today. Uh, and its weatherproof gabardine fabric, its precise cut and its practical details soon ensured that it became the officer's jacket of choice. When 1914 came around, the beginning of the First World War, um, Burberry was commissioned by the War Office in England to adapt the design for the new combat necessities of trench warfare. So Burberry added a few extra details, and the trench that we know today was born. Features of the original trench coat could include uh, so remember this, practical items to help fight a war. Uh, wrist straps to keep the wind out, double-breasted fastenings, a belt, storm patches for covering the neck more securely, gun pads at the shoulder, um, epaulets for holding gloves and for holding folding service caps as well, 
um, and D-rings on the belt to secure grenades um, or sidearms and swords. So really sort of military practical details were involved in the trench coat. Uh, now Humphrey Bogart that we can see here on the right hand side is really thought to embody the sort of trench coat attitude of jaded cool um, in the, a lot of the films that he made in the 1930s and 40s. But he actually only wore this coat in two scenes in the film Casablanca, which is what he's probably most well remembered for wearing this uh, coat in. And of course, it's still associated today with Burberry, who recreate this very, very classic item every season. You know, every season it's uh, kind of reinvented. But it actually was born out of the necessities of trench warfare. Okay, the little black dress, or the LBD, as we know it today in fashion shorthand, has become such a style perennial that it's very hard to believe that besides a very brief period in the 16th century, um, when the Spanish fashion for black became all the rage um, at court, uh, besides that, black has not often been seen as a fashionable colour for women. Uh, because it was associated so heavily with mourning dress uh, before the 20th century. However, that all changed in 1926, uh, when the new, more democratic era of fashion, as opposed to the corsets and crinolines of Edwardian and Victorian fashion, was epitomised by Chanel's little black dress that you can see here. For the first time, American Vogue featured a simple black design by Chanel, and they actually predicted that it would become a style uniform. This was at a time when the mass production of Henry Ford's assembly line for making cars was really revolutionizing car ownership and was revolutionizing mass production as well. And the straight lines and simplicity of the LBD became Chanel's Model T, and Vogue even christened this dress Chanel's Ford. And you can see really how different it is to the styles that we've been looking at from early, earlier periods in history. It's a lot more practical, a lot more wearable, something that many of us still own today. You know, most women have a little black dress in their wardrobe at some, uh, you know, at some point. So the look was so pared down compared with what women of fashion were wearing just a decade earlier that it has invited comparison with servants' uniforms um, or of working girls such as shop assistants. These were things that were said about this dress at the time. And Chanel was also fond of telling women to dress as plainly as your maids. She really was a sort of, she ushered in the modern era um, of dressing. She incorporated things like uh, uniforms, items of menswear into her designs and really changed the way that women dress forever. So the LBD here really signifies modernity of the 20th century and the rise of minimalism and practicality in fashion as well. So moving forward uh, in the 20th century, uh, and this is Christian Dior's bar suit and jacket from his Corolle line from the very first Christian Dior show, which was shown on the 12th of February, 1947, and which was then dubbed the New Look by journalists. Now, it's important to remember when we look at this outfit that 1947 was only two years after the Second World War ended, and fabric rationing was still in place in many European countries. Home front fashion uh, was boxy, and followed military lines with square shoulders and knee-length skirts. So again, if you think of films like Casablanca, uh, sort of classic uh, World War II era styles for women, it wasn't especially glamorous. It was quite practical. Uh, clothing was very hard to get hold of. You had to use uh, rationing coupons. Glamour was not really something associated with day-to-day -day dressing. Even though it was encouraged by the government, it was very difficult to actually um, um, dress in a very sort of glamorous or fashionable way. Because material was scarce, it had been needed for the war effort. So, when the new couturier Christian Dior launched this collection, it caused a huge sensation and was immediately all the rage. 
It consisted of huge skirts with petticoats underneath to give the fullness, um, very, very tucked in waists and sloped and rounded shoulders. So kind of the very opposite of the styles that had been worn during the Second World War. Uh, now, this um, silhouette was achieved through structured undergarments such as waspy girdles, um, which is kind of like a smaller, simpler version of the corset. New look dresses were often boned, and so this sig signalled a return to an almost Victorian silhouette. If you think about those Charles Worth silhouettes that we looked at earlier, um, compared to the Chanel LBD in the middle, you can see that this is kind of harking back to an earlier time of ultra-femininity. And now this was also synonymous with the drive to get women back into the home after the Second World War. Women had been out working in factories um, and the government was keen to get them back into the home, back, um, back as homemakers, as caregivers. So these very feminine styles kind of helped with that drive. Now, as I said, fabric rationing had been imposed by governments during the war, um, which had led to much to really heavy restrictions on design. And that's why the new look was actually so shocking when it was first shown, because it used so much fabric that it was seen as unpatriotic to dress in this way. So it caused really huge debates um, for women in fashion. They wanted desperately to dress this way, but they knew that the fabric still wasn't necessarily available. So it was kind of a, a quandary as to what to do. However, it was adored by women. Uh, and it became the defining style of the next decade, as the 1950s signified a return to a fuller, uh, more feminine silhouette that was kind of epitomized by the pin-up styles and the voluptuous figures of the likes of Marilyn Monroe. And speaking of which, final item, Marilyn's dress here on the left. Now, last year, a poll voted this white halter neck dress that Marilyn Monroe wore in Billy Wilder's Seven Year Itch as the most iconic movie outfit of all time. It was created by the costume designer William Travilla uh, for the film Seven Year Itch in 1955. And arguably, this very scene uh, where Marilyn Monroe stands over a subway grate and her skirt blows up it's probably more famous than the film itself. Um, I doubt many people have actually seen the film, The Seven Year Itch. It's a good film, I would recommend you watching it, but definitely this scene kind of steals the film. It's become a hugely iconic moment in fashion and film history, but film hasn't always been such a source of inspiration for the fashion industry. The turning point for that was, in fact, another screen icon two decades earlier, and that was Joan Crawford, here on the right, in the film Letty Linton. Now, throughout the jazz age, throughout the 1920s, um, polite society, which included fashion media like Vogue magazine, really looked down on Hollywood for being somewhat vulgar. The costumes were too glitzy or they weren't fashion enough. You know, it was costume design, it wasn't couture. And so the style press largely ignored Hollywood during the silent era of Hollywood film. But in 1932, all of that changed. This is a pivotal film in fashion and film history, even though the film itself has hardly ever been seen. This film, Letty Linton, has been unavailable since the mid-1930s. Uh, because it was the subject of a copyright trial uh, shortly after it was released um, and has, is, has not been on release ever since. However, this dress that you can see here of really exaggerated organdy ruffles um, was created by the costume designer Adrian for Joan Crawford. Now, Adrian became a hugely famous costume designer and this dress has become part of Hollywood costume myth um, because it was reproduced and sold in shops, so women could, you know, could go to shops that had amazing names like uh, Screen Style and buy copies of this dress. Uh, and the numbers of this dress that were sold were hugely exaggerated by the Hollywood PR machine 
uh, which really spun the idea of this dress being bought it was sort of really out of control. So it was sold through Hollywood design tie-ins, and it also had a far-reaching influence on fashion trends for nearly the following two decades. So if you think about the strong shoulders that were in fashion throughout the end of the 1930s and right through the 1940s, as I've just mentioned in the pre-New Look era, many people credit that um, silhouette of the very strong shoulders to this very dress here. Now, while it's generally accepted that the volumi uh, voluminous shoulder was an exaggeration of a feature that was actually started by the Italian designer Elsa Schiaparelli, there can be no doubt that the costume designer Adrian popularized this motif for a much, much wider audience. So if you think about um, this sort of period in the 1930s, couture, you know, really as now is a very, very elite, small world. Um, whereas Hollywood film, in the 1930s, there were the highest numbers of viewing figures going to cinemas at any point in history. So if you create designs uh, for a film, the chances are most women are kind of going to kind of see these designs. And you can immediately see the Letty Linton effect in British Vogue at this time. Articles in British Vogue start taking America more seriously as a style influencer. Uh, and in April 1933, Vogue actually gave full credence to the influence of the movies because it wrote an article that was called, Does Hollywood Create? And the article really validates Hollywood costume as a style influence for the first time. And it situates the creations of designers, um, costume designers, alongside the reified designs of Parisian couturiers. And now in this article, what's really illuminating uh, is that the couturiers are nameless. They're not, you know, they're not, um, the label isn't specified, whereas the costume designers are. The article even features the Letty Linton dress itself, this very dress, and it recognizes this influence. Uh, it says, lots of little girls who saw that picture felt that they would die if they couldn't have a dress like that with the result that we have been flooded with little Joan Crawfords. So for the first time, American fashion really challenged the dominance of Paris as the style center. And it also laid the foundation for the obsession between celebrity and fashion that we still see to this day. So from style perennials like the LBD to Huguenot silk weavers, and from royal high heels to Hollywood, I hope that I've managed to convince you that true style certainly never lacks substance. Thank you. Uh, I think if anyone has any questions, I can take some questions. Yes? Mm, I know you only spoke about 10 important items, but how important do you think the mini was that I mean, there's a little bit of controversy as to who actually invented the mini. Was it Courage or was it Mary Quant? Um, is it the same case as uh, Scaparelli inventing um, the outfit that you were talking about and Adrian uh, popularizing it? So what do you think about that? And then the second question is, how important do you think Mainbocker's corset was? Do I think which corset was? Mainbocker. Um, okay, firstly, the mini, yep. That's a very good one. In fact, that could very easily have featured uh, in this list as well. Um, because, of course, it symbolizes um, really women's liberation in the 1960s. That's what it's kind of how it's always spoken about in fashion history, um, what it's always referred to as. Those um, areas of attribution of design and invention are always very, very difficult to pinpoint. Um, Yes, an argument still rages, Courage, Mary Quant, John Stevens as well, who was another London designer. Um, the truth, I think, of the matter is that there is no real definitive truth when you're looking at the people that really first initiated these designs. Um, Schiaparelli, in her autobiography, talks a lot about the fact that she, she invented the shoulder pad, she developed this style. But you've got to bear in mind that it's her autobiography um, she was very prone to telling fantastic stories, embellishing things. It's not to say it, it was untrue, but you know, you've got to take your sources 
into account when you're thinking of this. Um, fashion is, doesn't exist in a vacuum. Fashion is always influenced by the uh, social, uh, political, cultural situation in which it's created. So the mini skirt, you can kind of see why it emerged at that period in the 60s when it did emerge. Um, women were uh, enjoying a lot more freedoms um, and that was very symbolic of that. So in a way, it doesn't really matter who actually invented these items. The fact is that the items were a product of their time and a product of the culture um, that was happening all around them, I think. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah? Great. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, I think the corset has kind of, the corset gets a very bad rep in fashion history generally. Um, and it's an item that gets talked about an awful lot. Is it, uh, you know, was it repressive for women? How much injury did it actually, um, you know, impose on women that were wearing it? Um, there's actually, what I would recommend in terms of the corset in general, there's a brilliant book written by the fashion historian Valerie Steele uh, about the corset. And in that, she busts a lot of the myths that are often told specifically about the Victorian corset and about tight lacing. Uh, what she actually did, instead of relying on magazine reports and advertising, what she actually did was measure um, extant corsets that still exist to see what kind of waist measurement women were getting down to, um, which is a very interesting approach to take, uh, you know, looking at the actual material culture of dress itself. So in terms of the corset in general, I would recommend um, having a look at that for sure. I'm sure that will answer your question. Um, very, very fully indeed. Thanks. Hi, hello. Um, I'm interested to know if you were giving the same talk in, say, 100 years' time, um, whether there are any current trends or particular designs that you think you might be citing. That's a very good question. <laughs> um, I think... Uh, I think a lot of it would probably hinge on sort of technical innovations, 3D printing, stuff like that. I think you would uh, probably be able to pinpoint uh, maybe someone like, I think Iris Van Herpen uses a lot of 3D printing in her designs, certainly very sculptural, the kind of items that she creates. Possibly also someone like Mary Katransu, with, who sort of innovate, um, innovated uh, digital printing, which then became a huge, huge trend. Um, I think also wearable tech, I guess, would probably feature in there at some point. It's an area that fashion is still negotiating. I don't think that all of the issues have been fully ironed out yet uh, between sort of merging the two, but it is a, a huge area for, um, um, for growth that I think will feed into future trends in a huge, huge way. And the other area, I think, is sustainability um, and eco-fashion. Um, there's a big um, sustainability department at London College of Fashion, people doing all kinds of research. Um, and I think that something to do with that will also feed into the way that fashion um, is produced in the future, I think. Probably something that would maybe not necessarily that the fast fashion system will die out but i think we're probably going to see a shift towards more sustainable means of production manufacture and so i would hope that that would be something that you could feature as well yeah good question <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That's another good one as well. The mini skirt could definitely feature in this list. Uh, jeans could definitely feature in this list as well because it tells that whole story about workwear being appropriated into high fashion, um, sort of known as the bubble up um, theory in um, sort of fashion, fashion theory. Uh, yeah, I think there's a, there's a huge story around that, the idea that it was initially created for workmen, for gold miners, for cowboys, um, and then throughout the course of the 20th century, you see it sort of creeping further and further up the fashion 
ladder in a way, I guess. So from sort of countercultural heroes, you know, people, you know, films, James Dean, Marlon Brando, that kind of thing that makes it cool in the 1950s. And then by the 1980s, you have the real designer denim boom. Um, uh, and that feeds into the idea of branding and marketing of fashion as well. So yes, absolutely, that could be that could feature in in this ten garments as well. Yeah. Thank you. Any Is last question? Hi. Um, I know it hasn't spawned too many copycat outfits, but where do you think Lady Gaga's meat dress sits within history, and what do you think it's going to do in the future? Oh, okay, that's interesting. Um, that outfit has recently been acquisitioned by a museum, uh, which in terms of fashion in museums and the idea of conservation throws up a whole load of interesting questions. Because I think the way that they decided to conserve it is by drying it out and then repainting it. So, I mean, that that's, uh, opens up a whole host of issues around the idea of conserving items in museums which is a slight side issue, but is interesting nonetheless. Um, well, I think that very clearly plays into the idea of celebrity in fashion, and also the idea of shock tactics and fashion as well, I think, which is another strand that you could definitely uh, include in a list like this. So in, if you're thinking about sort of shocking fashion, you could think about post-war subcultures, you could think about designers like Vivian Westwood, um, even designers like Alexander McQueen as well, I think, and the way that that sort of shock factor became a very uh, visible presence in late 20th century fashion. And I think that that meat dress, it, I mean, it sort of crosses the line, obviously, between fashion and costume. It's not like it was available for other people to buy in the shops, is it? Thankfully. Um, but I think it would fit into that trajectory, I think, of the shock factor in fashion. Yeah. And also protest, actually, is, isn't it? Because she wore it as a, a protest against um, the repealing of the amendments in America. Don't ask, don't tell, wasn't it? I think against, it was basically a pro, um, a pro-gay protest she wore it for force. And I think that feeds into it as well, again, with people like Vivian Westwood who use protest as a very big part of their design aesthetic. Yeah, yeah, an, an interesting piece, definitely. Thank okay. you, Amber. Thanks very much. Enjoy, um, enjoy Fashion Forward. Thank you.